So here we are in chapter 14 talking about your lymphatic system and um, immunity. Sometimes the lymphatic system is called your immune system, but technically immune system is not one of your 11 body systems. It's your lymphatic system and your immunity um, kind of functions with that lymphatic system. So your lymphatic system functions um, in fluid balance, fat absorption, and also defense where the immunity part comes into it. Here's, here shows the lymphatic system kind of um, drainage system and how it drains the lymph in your body. And we'll talk about what lymph is. Some of the organs associated with your lymphatic system um, will be your tonsils, your lymph nodes, um, your thymus, your spleen. Really simply put the lymphatic system and the organs and lymphatic vessels that are shown here in, in green in your body um, are kind of your body's catch-all system for all the excess interstitial fluid um, that maybe doesn't get um, filtered through your kidneys or it's not in your blood. So it's all of the excess interstitial fluid will be picked up in your lymphatic system. The components of your lymphatic system is the lymph, and this is the fluid that enters the lymphatic capillaries. It's composed of water and some solutes, and it just is your body's drainage system um, that isn't going through your kidneys or your liver or your blood vessels. Um, it consists of your lymphocytes, which are white blood cells, lymphatic vessels, your lymph nodes, tonsils, spleen, and your thymus gland. The lymphatic capillaries will carry fluid in one direction from tissues to the circulatory system. So all of your lymphatic capillaries will eventually end up um, in the superior vena cava. So eventually getting all that filtered blood back to the bloodstream. The fluid will move from the blood capillaries into tissue spaces. And lymphatic capillaries are tiny close-ended vessels. Fluid will move easily into them, into most tissues, and they'll eventually join up together to form all of your lymphatic vessels. Your lymphatic vessels are much like small veins. Um, your lymphatic capillaries will join up to form them. Uh, they're one-way valves associated with them, so all the fluid goes in one direction. The right lymphatic duct is where all your lymphatic vessels will form your right upper limb and the right head and neck, and it'll empty into the right subclavian vein, which will eventually empty out into um, the superior vena cava. The thoracic duct is how the rest of the body will empty from the lymphatic vessels. It will empty into your left subclavian vein. So if you remember your brachiocephalic um, vein kind of splits into a right and a left subclavian veins. So what this is just showing that these lymphatic vessels will all eventually empty out into um, the subclavian veins, which will go to the superior vena cava and back into the heart. So this just shows how lymph is formed and moves. So the lymphatic vessel is the green one. And you can see here the tissues, the lymphatic capillaries are in green. And this just shows you the direction of fluid, either entering the lymphatic vessel from capillaries or fluid entering from other tissue cells. And then how the direction of lymph flows within the lymphatic capillaries. And you can see here the valves are allowing um, the lymph to flow forward or in only one direction. The lymphatic organs, we have your tonsils and you have several different types of tonsils. Your palatine tonsils are on each side of the oral cavity. The pharyngeal tonsils are near the internal opening of the nasal cavity. They're also known as your adenoids. You have lingual tonsils um, on the back side of your tongue, which will form a protective ring of lymphatic tissue around your nasal and oral cavities. So you, here you can see kind of where these tonsils are located um, in the oral cavity or in the back of the oral cavity, um, pulling back the tongue here you, so you can see the lingual tonsil. The lymph nodes are rounded structures that vary in size. They're located near your lymphatic vessels, um, located in your groin, your armpit, your neck. Lymph will pass through these lymph nodes before entering the blood. And sometimes the lymph nodes can get swollen um, which could be an indication of an infection because they're filled with some of the white blood cells that are trying to fight off that infection. Lymph will move through um, the immune system and it's activated by lymphocytes being produced if a foreign substance is detected. Um, and lymphocytes will be important for the removal of different microbes by the macrophages. 
So this is what a lymph node looks like. Um, again, showing the direction of fluid, either entering it and then being filtered out of it. Um, so within this lymph node, there would be a way for it to um, get rid of anything harmful, whether that's a microbe or a bacteria um, that was in your body um, for a lymphocyte or a macrophage to help get rid of it, um, phagocytize it, um, to try to get rid of anything foreign from the body. Uh, the spleen is about the size of a clenched fist. It's located in your abdomen. It will be important in filtering blood um, and kind of um, even breaking apart red blood cells to reuse some of the components of them. It will also detect and respond to foreign substances, destroying old red blood cells and acting as a blood reservoir. So your spleen is also an organ that become, can become enlarged. Um, and some people who have an infection, I'm thinking of the mono, um, have pain kind of in their left abdominal region. And that pain could be coming from the enlarged spleen because it's trying to fight off that mono infection. Um, the spleen is made up of white and red pulp. The white pulp is the lymphatic tissue that surrounds the arteries. And the red pulp will contain macrophages and red blood cells that will connect to veins. So this is just a look at your spleen and how it's located in kind of this upper left quadrant of the abdomen. The splenic artery vein will come to and from it. And you can see here the white pulp um, and the red pulp. The white pulp will surround the arteries um, and the red pulp will be um, exterior or um, separate from that white pulp. The thymus gland is a bilobed gland. It's located in the mediastinum. Um, so that is the area right behind your sternum. It stops growing at age one. And then it will, at age 60, it actually decreases in size. Your thymus gland is important for producing um, and being the location for maturing your lymphocytes. And you have two types of lymphocytes that we'll talk about, your T and B lymphocytes. Um, so the thymus gland is a really important player in your immune system because it will be uh, the place that matures lymphocytes. So here's a look at the thymus gland. Again, it's located in the mediastinum um, in front of the aorta, but right behind the sternum. So here's your thymus gland, important for producing lymphocytes. I have a lymphocytes. quick question. Yeah. I have a quick question about that. Um, yes. So since it develops fully by the age of one, um, would any sort of infection or, or lack of maturity um, cause the body more to be more susceptible to lymphoma? Um, Does that relate at all? I know questions. it's... Yeah, these are great questions, Ryan, Shay, and I'm not totally sure. Um, all I know is, you know, you, th you think of like um, babies getting the antibodies passed on to them. This, uh -huh. there's, for, for many different reasons for that, it's important. Um, why they get the antibodies passed on as a form of passive immunity. I'm not sure if that has to do specifically with a thymus. I would assume it would be because their thymus isn't fully maybe functional. Um, okay. I, I'm not sure about lymphoma though. Because um, my, uh, there's only, the only reason I ask is when you said uh, T cell and B cell, she had B cell lymphoma and I didn't realize your thymus was in that area and her tumor was connected to her heart and her lymphatic system. So it just, that kind of all pieced it together. I just heard keywords. So I was wondering if. Yeah. Under no, that sounds really interesting. I think it's all with that, Ryan Shea, but I am not totally sure. Um, like specifically, okay. but I, it's, it is related to this. I'm not sure how though. Okay. That's really well, I'll definitely look into that, but thank you. Yeah. That's very interesting. Thanks for sharing too. Um, so here just gives you an overview of the lymphatic system, um, showing you what organs are in play, um, where kind of some of the B and T cells will be used. But this gives, I think it's really hard to read this even from my view, um, but it shows you kind of how fluid gets filtered maybe, or fluid that comes from the blood um, will be picked up and get lymphatic capillaries as, a, as any excess interstitial fluid and then make its way through the vessels back into um, this superior vena cava, so back into circulation. So the lymphatic system is kind of this in between, between your arteries and veins to catch any excess fluid that could be going through um, the other parts of your bodies and organs. 
Okay, so immunity. So again, um, the lymphatic system is one of your body's 11 organ systems. The immune system doesn't exist, but we often associate the immune system with your lymphatic system because this is where we get the idea of immunity. And what is immunity? It's the ability to resist damage from anything foreign to your body. Um, immunity can protect against microbes, toxins, and cancer cells. And we have two types of immunity, innate and adaptive. Uh, in is present at birth, defense against by a barrier, for example, your skin or your membrane. Uh, physical barriers as a part of this innate immunity. This is your body's first line of defense. So your skin, your mucous membranes, these will be barriers. Your mucous membranes, think of internal or even at your body's openings will act as a barrier. Tears, saliva, urine will also wash away pathogens. Uh, a chemical mediator is any chemical that can kill a microbe and prevent their entry into cells. So we get your lysozyme um, is an enzyme found in tears and saliva to kill bacteria. Your mucous membranes will have chemicals in them to help prevent entry of microbes. Histamine will promote inflammation by causing vasodilation of your blood vessels. So increased kind of passageway of blood to get to the area, um, whether to clot it or to get other factors there. If there's some sort of increase of inflammation, an interferon will be a protein that protects against a viral infection by stimulating the surrounding cells to produce an antiviral protein. Cells of the immune system, your white blood cells, also known as leukocytes, uh, they are produced in the red bone marrow and the lymphatic tissue that fights foreign substances. You have phagocytic cells, and you'll hear about phagocytic cells a lot. What they do is they phagocytize things, and that means they will ingest or eat them and then destroy anything foreign to your body. And neutrophils and macrophages are an example of a phagocytic cell that will ingest and destroy something foreign. Um, neutrophils are the first to respond to an infection. They die very quickly. Uh, neutrophils are your body's most abundant white blood cell. Acenophils are produced in your red bone marrow and they will release chemicals to reduce inflammation. Basophils are also made in the red bone marrow. They leave the blood and enter the infected tissue and they're the ones that can release histamine. Macrophages um, initially were monocytes and monocyte is just a type of white blood cell. Um, so macrophages uh, can leave blood and enter tissues and they will ingest more than a neutral fill. Um, so macrophage, macrophagocytize, they'll like be bigger to engulf something. Uh, they protect the lymph and the lymph nodes and blood and the spleen and liver and they are given specific names for certain areas of the body. So you'll have cut fur cells in the liver and they're just a specific type of a macrophage. Uh, a mast cell is made in your red bone marrow found in your skin, the lungs, the GI tract, the urogenital tract. Um, it can release leukotrienes, which will help um, kind of fight off anything foreign. Natural, natural killer cells are a type of lymphocyte produced in the red bone marrow, um, they will recognize classes of cells such as tumor cells or virus infected cells, and they will release chemicals to lysis cells. Uh, this lysis means to split cells open. So natural killer cells will have chemicals in them to split apart or kill cells because when cells lyse, um, they'll be completely destroyed. The inflammatory response then is kind of your body's response to anything foreign. It involves chemical and cells um, due to injury. Um, it'll be signaled by the presence of anything foreign to the body, and it will stimulate the release of a chemical mediator. So here's the inflammatory response. Um, kind of, it'll start when any sort of bacteria enters the tissue and causes damage to that tissue. 
So the bacteria will enter, cause damage. Um, chemical mediator, mediators will be released. Um, chemotaxis will increase vascular permeability. Um, that means that it'll increase the ability for blood to get to the area of infection. There'll be increased numbers of white blood cells and chemical mediators at the site of the damage, which will phagocytize the bacteria, destroy it or contain it. It will try to eliminate the bacteria altogether and then try to repair the tissue. Or if the bacteria remain, we get into this um, kind of negative feedback loop where additional chemical mediators will be activated to keep this cycle going until all the bacteria are eliminated and the tissue repair can start. So that was innate immunity. And now we're gonna talk about, so that what we first talked about innate immunity, that is all present uh, when you're born. Here's adaptive immunity. It's the defense that involves specific recognition to a specific antigen. And this immunity is required after birth and it will react when innate defenses won't work it's much slower reacting than innate immunity and it has memory, um, meaning it will remember if it's been kind of in the battlefield so it can will be able to fight off an infection or bacteria again. And this adaptive immunity uses your B and T cells, which are types of lymphocytes, which is a type of white blood cell. Uh, there's two types of antibody, um, of two types of adaptive immunity, either antibody mediated or cell mediated. So some terms re related to adaptive immunity are antigen, and an antigen is a substance that will stimulate an immune response. So an antigen can be a bacteria, a virus, pollen, food, drugs. An antigen can be anything that the body will recognize as foreign. A self antigen will be a molecule produced by the person's body that will stimulate an immune system response. And then an antibody are proteins that the body produces in response to an antigen. So you have antibodies in your plasma for specific antigens, whether it's foreign or self antigen. Um, and they are just proteins that the body will produce in response to that antigen. When the um, origin when the mother give that to the child? Yeah, so the mother can give antibodies to the child in breast milk. Um, so that's why they say breastfeeding is really important, but they, they can get antibodies in other ways as well. But yes, the mother gives those to the child. They can also develop them um, throughout the first year of their life as well. But that will be by experience in there, right? Yes, yeah. We'll talk about vaccines too. Yep. I had a quick question on the previous slide. Yes. Um, how, how does that relate to autoimmune diseases? Um, like the self antigen and the antibody? Yeah, so an autoimmune disease, like rheumatoid arthritis, um, what are there some? RA is the person I thought of. And that's that's yeah. what I have is rheumatoid oh. arthritis. And then there's like, there's lupus, MS, um, yes, stuff MS. like that. Yep, those are all autoimmune. Basically, you know, specifically how those work and any autoimmune disease is just when the body's immune system attacks itself. So there's no cure for this. There's only like management to autoimmune diseases. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of specifics that with RA. Yeah. I was gonna say, would that be set off by a self antigen or how does how does that most relate likely to it? because it's yeah no i i would assume it would be some sort of self antigen because it's your own body that's attacking itself in an antigen example these are anything kind of foreign outside of the body um i'm not sure though ryan shea specifically about I would assume it would be categorized in the self antigen category. Okay. Hey, right, one I've more, heard one it's more question. Fun though. Yes. Yeah. You guys have great so questions. If you have that, doctor, so I can these. if you have that that residue's neural blood type, that goal blood type, how how would you? The what blood type? It's it's called the rarest blood type. They call it goal blood. But it's the name is R E H E S U S. Oh, rhesus. That has to do the rhesus factor is like a positive or negative. 
<laughs> well, they, I like, I did a research when we were doing the blood stuff. Well, I, I was oh, yeah. studying, and then okay. this gold blood came up, and then uh, it says it was like rare, maybe like thirty-five out of fifty people right now in the world might have it. Uh, so if you have like some weird blood type, how will your immune system function? Would it just be normal? It just be like any other blood type? Just acquired by yeah, experience so pretty much? Yes. So like this idea of a self antigen, those are like the antigens that are on your own red blood cells. Um, so yeah, if you are living with a rare blood type, you just have it. I mean, and your body has a way, I mean, it creates its own antibodies for anything against that red blood type. So you'd probably have to just be really careful with like blood transfusions. Yeah, I was, yeah, I definitely read. And then they, uh, they recommend those people to donate blood as often as possible, but it's, it's okay, like, sure. I didn't even know about that. Yeah. Assuming maybe, it, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm not too sure about that. Um, I know that they call O negative gold blood because it, they're universal donors. Yeah, I think I would assume too. I think that you would probably be the O negative category. Because you can That's, donate to anyone. I posted it on the chat, the name of it. I can't even pronounce it. Okay, rhesus null. I, yeah, so rhesus null, the rhesus back, I assume it's a negative and being the gold, it would probably be the O. So I, I think it's just O negative blood. Might, that might be another name for it. That's my guess. I mean, but that's easy to find. Even like positive and negative O blood type are easy to find. So they, it can't be just... Oh, I have to keep looking into it. Yeah, look for some more. So there's a lot, of, yeah, there's a lot of different antigens associated with blood types. Um, the A, B and positive or negative, the D antigen are the most like commonly grouped, but there are many other antigens that are associated with your blood. For many blood transfusions, they don't interact or they won't have a matter. But if you're going into surgery and you're gonna get a heart replaced, lung replaced, liver replaced, They'll probably look at other um, blood blood typing groups to make sure that everything does match up, um, especially with like uh, organ transplant patients. So I'm, I, it might be even one that. I just Googled that. it real quick. It was saying that, so RH negative is with the, the D antigen, right? Mm -hmm. um, it says that it's missing all, RH null blood is missing all 60 of the possible antigens related to blood. So it says okay, it has so none it be, of them. Yeah, so it wouldn't have A and B and maybe it wouldn't have all the others as well. Thanks uh -huh. Drew, for your comment too. Yeah, rhesus null means negative, yeah. Thanks for the discussion guys, great. Okay. Okay, so how do your lymphocytes develop? Um, they will develop in your stem cells. So in the red bone marrow, this will give rise to all of your blood cells and your stem cells in uh, the red bone marrow will just differentiate or give rise into some pre T cells and to some pre B cells, which are the types of lymphocytes. Um, your lymphocytes are a type of white blood cell. It's involved in adaptive immunity. It will develop from stem cells, meaning um, it comes from kind of one line of initial cell, and then it'll just differentiate into either a type B or type T cell. Uh, B cells are involved in antibody mediated immunity. Um, they originate from your stem cells in the, and mature in the red bone marrow, like we said. They will move to lymphatic tissue after they mature and your B cells are what will lead to a production of antibodies. So if you can remember or associate uh, B cells with um, production of antibodies, that's kind of your connection uh, study tip with B cells. Uh, T cells are kind of the other main type of lymphocyte. They're involved in the cell mediated immunity primarily, as well as antibody mediated immunity. Uh, they mature in your thymus gland, then they'll move to the lymphatic tissue after they mature. And you have four types of T cells. So this is a look at just the origin and processing of B and T cells where they will all originate from a common stem cell. And then that stem cell will differentiate into pre B and T cells and eventually into B cells in the bone marrow or T cell in the thymus. 
they'll go into the interstitial um, fluid and then into the lymphatic system where they'll be ready to go um, if the opportunity arises that they need to help with. Um, antigen recognition. So your lymphocytes, your B and T cells have antigen receptors on their surface and they were called B cell receptors if they're on a B cell and a T cell receptor if they're on a T cell. Each receptor will, will only bind with a specific antigen. So this means that your B and your T cells are very specific to the antigen that it will try to fight off. When the antigen receptors combine with the antigen, the lymphocyte will become activated and this idea of adaptive immunity will now begin. The MHC molecule stands for the major histocompatibility complex molecule. It will contain binding sites for antigens and it will be very specific for certain types of antigens. It will hold and present a processed antigen on the surface of its cell membrane. And then it will be able to bind to an antigen receptor on a B or a T cell to stimulate a response. So this is just kind of a complex molecule that has its own uh, binding sites for antigens, very specific for them. And then it will be able to bind to an antigen receptor on a B and a T cell to stimulate some sort of response. Cytokines are proteins secreted by a cell that regulates neighboring cells. And an example of this is the interleukin-1 that is released by macrophages um, that will stimulate helper T cells. So there's just a lot of, I know in this chapter, there's just a lot of names of these cells and then we'll kind of tie it together towards the end. Um, but I know there's a lot in this chapter. But cytokines are just a protein secreted by a cell that regulates neighboring cells. And one example is interleukin-1 that's released by macrophages. Again, macrophages are big cells that will engulf and digest uh, bacteria or anything foreign. And these will stimulate helper T cells. Proliferation of helper T cells. So let's take a look here. So here's an antigen um, presenting cell like a macrophage. It'll phagocytize process and display an antigen on the cell's surface. The antigens will then be bound to that um, complex class two molecules, which will present the processed antigen to the T cell receptor of the helper T cell. So the MHC molecules is kind of just this like helper molecule that gets um, the antigen processed and then gets it taken to the T cell um, where it'll get, where, where it'll attach to the receptor on that T cell. Um, interleukin-1 then will be secreted by the macrophage and we have a CD4, which is another type of glycoprotein from a T cell. Um, interleukin-1 will stimulate the helper T cell to secrete interleukin-2 to produce interleukin-2 receptors. The helper T cell will stimulate itself to divide when interleukin-2 will bind to interleukin-2 receptors. And then we get daughter helper T cells result. They will be stimulated to divide if they're exposed to the same antigen that stimulated the parent helper T cells. So this will just increase the number of helper T cells. An increased number of helper T cells can facilitate the activation of other B cells or effective T cells. So this is just the idea of how we get um, this adaptive immunity to a specific antigen. It kind of takes you through this process of an antigen is anything foreign. Um, this MHC complex is involved, interleukins are involved to help a helper T cell divide into daughter cells that will be further able to recognize the same antigen um, if it's present in the body again. So that's what we're talking about here, proliferating, making more, dividing more helper T cells um, that will remember or be responsible for an antigen once it first um, is exposed in your body. Uh, lymphocyte proliferation. So how are your lymphocytes um, proliferated more? After the antigen is processed um, and present to helper T cells, the helper T cells will produce interleukin-2 and interleukin-2 receptors. So this is kind of a summary of what 
that previous slide went over. Interleukin-2 will bind to receptors and stimulate more helper T cells being produced. The helper T cells are needed to produce more B cells. And remember, B cells are what produce your antibodies. So then we're getting to this idea of producing more antibodies because we want to create the B cells to produce the antibodies, which will eventually be able to fight off um, more antigens. So this takes you through the prolifer proliferation of B cells, um, eventually getting into daughter B cells. Making more B cells means making more antibodies in the plasma. Um, so again, I don't know how detailed the test is because I haven't looked at it yet, but I, as long as you know the idea of proliferating more B cells, meaning you're creating more antibodies that will be associated with this antigen that it's trying to recognize as foreign, um, to build up a body's resistance for that. Uh, the dual nature of your immune system refers to the idea that your lympho lymphocytes, again, your white blood cell, gives rise to two types of immune responses, the antibody-mediated and the cell-mediated response. Antigens can trigger both types of responses that we just talked about. It can create more antibodies or it can create more uh, B cells or T cells. So that's what the idea of these antigens can trigger both types of responses. It'll create more antibodies or create more of your white blood cells. Both types are able to recognize your self versus your non-self because you have self antigens. They're both extremely specific and they both have memory, meaning once your body is exposed to a type of antigen, um, it will be able to remember that antigen for further um, further use if it's um, associated with that again. Um, so the antibody mediated immunity is effective against antigens in your body fluids, like your blood and your lymph. So we talk about antibody mediated immunity is important for um, fighting against bacteria, viruses, and toxins. And your antibody mediated immunity, like we said before, will use B cells to produce more antibodies. What is an antibody? It's the letter Y. I feel like we should break out into the YMCA. That was like the most popular song when I was a kid, but I'm probably much older than you guys. Maybe not everyone. So the letter Y shape is what an antibody looks like. Um, the variable region is the V part of the Y, and this part will bind to the epitopes of antigen using antigen binding sites. And then the constant region is the bottom part or the stem of the Y. Uh, each class of immunoglobulin has the same structure. So there's five types of immunoglobulins in the body and those are just um, five types of antibodies. So immunoglobulin and antibody, um, they're kind of interchangeable words. So here's a look at the antibody structure. Here's the V part that it referred to. And so the V part um, is called the variable region. And this is the part that will bind to different antigens. And then the constant region, and then it, you can see there's different heavy light chains associated with this. Um, this is the constant region. And this will be, the constant region will fall into one of five classes of immunoglobulins. Uh, but the antigen or the variable regions can then be very specific for what antigen it will be binding to. So the antigen binding site is the site on the antibody where the antigen will bind. Um, valence is the number of antigen binding sites on the antibody. And there's five classes of immune, immunoglobulins used to destroy antigens. So these are the five classes of immunoglobulins, G, M, A, E, D. So they're all labeled I, G for immunoglobulin. And then there's an upper left case letter for the different type or the different class of the immunoglobulin. So G, M, A, E, and D. So here are the different antibody structures based on the different type of immunoglobulin. So this is what the G one looks like. Um, you can see how, how the only differences there might be, even though G and E look exactly the same in this picture, um, the, you can see how there might be differences between the heavy and light chains just of how the antibody is structured. So these are immunoglobulins. Um, there's five different classes. 
Um, immunoglobulin G, so IgG, um, makes up about 80 to 85% in your serum. It activates complement and increases phagocytosis, so the idea of engulfing anything foreign. Um, this is, antibody can cross the placenta and provide protection to the fetus. It's responsible for RH reactions, so a reaction um, to that rhesus factor, that positive antigen in the blood, such as hemolytic disease of the newborn. So this is the antibody that will be responsible for um, attacking this RH factor in a newborn if a mother's body has this RGG antibody um, made for that RH factor. IgM makes up about five to 10% in the serum. It will activate the complement, which will act as an antigen binding receptor on the surface of the B cells. It's responsible for transfusion reactions in the ABO blood system, and it will often be the first antibody produced in response to an antigen. So your IgM is the antibody responsible for transfusion reactions in the ABO blood typing system. IgA is secreted in your saliva, tears, your mucous membrane. So this will be the one that will protect your body surfaces. Um, IgA is a type of antibody that's found in colostrum, colostrum um, which is the first milk uh, that the baby gets from the mom and also subsequent milk to provide immune protection to the newborn. So that's IgA. IgE is the least common or the least kind of in less amounts. It will bind to mast cells and basophils and stimulate the inflammatory response. And then IgD is about 0.2% and it functions as an antigen binding receptor specifically on those B cells. And again, B cells are the type of lymphocytes that'll go on and create further antibodies. Effects of antibodies. So what can they do? They can when they bind to them. They can bind antigens together. They can activate this complement cascade, which is kind of this immune system response. It can initiate, the antibodies can initiate the release of inflammatory chemicals to the site of infection or distress or um, destruction of tissue. And they can also facilitate phagocytosis. So lots of different things antibodies can do, very important. So this kind of takes you through those different kind of ways, effects of antibodies, um, how an antigen will bind to the antibody, how they can inactivate antigens, they can bind antigens together. They can activate the complement cascades, which shows here um, an example of this is an antigen binding to an antibody, and that can activate this complement protein, which will produce more inflammation or chemotaxis or lysis of the cell. So that complement cascade is just a cascade um, of immune response. And it can also initiate the release of inflammatory chemicals. Antibody production, uh, the primary response is the first exposure of the B cell to the antigen. So how, again, do B cells create antibodies? The B cell first has to be exposed to the antigen, and then the B cell will undergo division and will form plasma cells and memory cells. So again, we're in our B cell, B cell mentality, because we're talking about how antibodies are being produced. So first the B cell gets exposed to the antigen. Then the B cell undergoes division to form a plasma cell or the memory cell. Plasma cells produce antibodies. Um, it takes about three to 14 days to be effective against the antigen. So it takes about three to 14 days to produce antibodies. Um, the person will develop disease symptoms in this time, um, but, but then these plasma cells will produce the antibodies. The secondary response then are these memory cells that are produced. So this will occur when the immune system is exposed to the antigen that it has seen before. So the B memory cells will quickly divide to form plasma cells, which will produce antibodies against it, and also to produce more memory cells. So more new memory cells, um, because this is something that the body has seen before. So they've been exposed to this antigen. It produces these memory cells um, because it, it it has already seen this antigen before. So this is just a look at how kind of from a primary response versus a secondary response. Uh, the primary response 
is after the first exposure creating antibodies, it, it's a longer response because it takes about three to 14 days. But a secondary response, this will occur when another exposure to the same um, antigen causes the memory cells to rapidly form plasma cells and additional memory cells to produce those antibodies. So the secondary response is faster because you already have these memory cells in place um, that have remembered that antigen in the body. This, is everyone with me so far? I don't even know, how are we doing? I know we're heavy today. Just wanna see how we're doing in terms of the lecture. Just a couple slides left. And I lost my screen. This we hopefully woke you guys up a little bit. The cell-mediated immunity then. Um, cell-mediated immunity will be used against antigens in cells and tissues. It will be effective against intracellular bacteria, so bacteria that has made its way inside cells, viruses, fungi, and protozoa, um, which are kind of another class of molecule. Um, it uses different types of T cells. It uses what we call helper T cells and cytotoxic T cells. Uh, helper T cells activate macrophages, um, which are, again, a part of those big cells that engulf foreign substances. Helper T cells will also help form B cells. So again, B cells are our antibody producing cells. And helper T cells will also promote the production of these T C cells. These T, -T, -T C cells are our cytotoxic T cells, and they are pre the precursors to cytotoxic T lymphocytes, often abbreviated CTL. Cytotoxic T lymphocytes are really important for destroying an antigen directly on contact. And regulatory T cells will just turn off the immune system response when the antigen is gone. So these are just different types of T cells for cell-mediated immunity. Here, it takes you a look at the proliferation of cytotoxic T cells. Um, here we get different receptors. This CD8 is important, interleukin-2. Um, I don't think you guys need to know the details in this because I teach this in my physiology class right now. So I don't think your test will be this detailed, but you can look here. Again, we see this MHC class molecule displaying an antigen. And again, our MHC molecule is kind of like our mediator, our helper kind of transport protein for, a, for an antigen or a processed antigen. Uh, the activation of a cytotoxic T cell will begin when the T cell receptor bind, binds to that um, complex molecule with its antigen within it. There's a co-stimulation of the cytotoxic T cell by what we call CD8 and other surface molecules. There's a co-stimulation by cytokines like the interleukin-2 released from a helper T cell. And this will activate the cytotoxic T cell causing it to divide into further T cells producing many more cytotoxic T cells um, even though only two were shown here. Then the stimulation and effects of those T cells. So the activation of a cytotoxic T cell by the antigen on the surface of a cell um, will produce more cytotoxic T cells or memory cells. The cytotoxic T cells are kind of, they will release your cytokines, which will produce inflammation. They will also kill the antigen on contact. Um, so the target cell, so if this will kill the, so here's our target cell binding to a cytotoxic T cell and eventually causing the target cell to lyse and that will destroy the cell because it will completely split open um, in terms of that. So this is another fun chart, which I'm sure you're excited about because um, it kind of is confusing. Um, another kind of chart that shows how all of these cells will interact kind of all together with the immune system. So here you he have some sort of antigen, um, whether it's foreign um, or the body recognizes it itself and the body's system of getting rid of it, whether it's a chemical mediator, a physical barrier, or it'll eventually be taken up by a neutrophil, macrophage, basophil, or a sinophil. And then it will get into this kind of cascade response of developing helper T cells to secrete cytokines which will eventually, um, helper T cells will activate B cells, which will get us to our antibodies or our memory response to remember that antigen. Um, and we'll get to our helper T cells, which will get us 
to further activate cytotoxic T cells, which will be our killer cells. Um, so this kind of takes you through the two lines of whether we have an antibody mediated immunity or a cell mediated immunity and how the body's simple way of defending itself against one antigen that it would recognize as foreign. Types of adaptive immunity, um, we'll talk a little bit here about um, how immunity gets passed on through either a virus exposure or get passed on from mother to child. Um, we have naturally acquired immunity. This can be active or passive. So this is a type of immunity, adaptive immunity. Again, it's not innate, you're not born with this. So this is adaptive immunity that you will acquire naturally, um, actively through natural exposure to an antigen, which will cause production of those antibodies. This can be lifelong immunity like mononucleosis. Um, another one I think you would say is, um, what am I thinking of chickenpox? Um, now you get a vaccine for chicken pox, but back in the day, I feel so old. I got chicken pox when I was like five. So that's another type of active, naturally acquired immunity where you get naturally exposed to the antigen and that will cause um, antibodies to produce and memory cells to give you lifelong immunity. Um, passive immunity is the transfer of antibodies from mother to child that will, that will happen in utero through the placenta or through the breast milk um, once the child is born. Then we get artificially acquired immunity. And this is where we can talk about vaccines or other um, injection of antibodies. So you get an active artificially acquired immunity, which is the injection of an antigen, like a vaccine, which will cause the production of your body to create those antibodies. Um, immunization is a process of introducing killed, live, or inactivated pathogens um, to give your, your body the ability to produce the antibody against um, a type of antigen. So this is what makes um, vaccinations and immunizations so great in the medical field, especially in the day of polio, rubella, measles, mumps, when people were just dying, you know, in their own kind of plague terms, um, why um, you know vaccines and immuni immunizations can be really important for that. There's a lot of talk behind vaccines and immunizations now. Um, some people are totally against them. You know, some people can do own research and kind of spread them out over the course. You know, of because some people give their kids like six shots in a day, and maybe they think that's too much or whatever, and they can spread them out. But um, either way, immunization vaccines, there's no doubt that they do a lot of good. Um, so whatever fence you are on that, um, they, they have been proven to do a lot of good. So, and it only works if it's herd immunity, if everyone gets the shot, but I'll go off my soapbox for that. The passive um, immunity is in, in the injection of antibodies from another person or an animal. So that would just be a passive form. So this is an artificially acquired immunity, usually through vaccines, active um, or passive is the injection of the antibodies itself. So you're not introducing um, the vaccine or the virus, you're just introducing the antibody right away. Okay, so ways to acquire adaptive immunity, um, either through active or passive. This is just a great kind of chart summary what we just talked about. So we all want to get to this acquired adaptive immunity either through um, active ways or passive ways. Active is immunity provided by the individual's um, own immune system. Um, naturally by antigens are introduced through natural exposure or artificially antigens are deliberately induced in a vaccine. Where passive immunity is the immunity being transferred from another person or an animal, either naturally uh, through the placenta or breast milk or artificially antibodies from um, another person or animal being injected.